Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we're going to deal with water issues in New Mexico. This is a vast and crucial topic, and we're honored today to have two guests, Peggy Johnson, who I'll explain who you are in a minute, and Laura Pascas. So, Peggy is a hydrogeologist with the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, but you're retiring after how many years? Uh, 21 years at um, the New Mexico Tech and the Bureau of Geology. And some of the things that you are famous for that we'll get into is aquifer mapping. Where is the water and how much yes. is there? And the thing that makes my heart go pitter-pat is paleohydrology. How old is the water yes. that we're s siphoning up? Um, you have much published, ran many programs. Now, Laura, you are a highly esteemed New Mexico journalist. You are a freelance. You, you cover the waterfront. You are published in New Mexico In-Depth, the Santa Fe Reporter, New Mexico Magazine, the New Mexico Independent, Audubon, the High Country News, Orion, all of those. You have a background, I just love this, in anthropology and archaeology, very close to my own interest. And the topics you deal with are, of course, water, which is one of the reasons we brought you here, climate change, environmental is issues, methane. You did the famous article on the copper rules, on the canary in the copper mine, um, and immigration, lots of things, methane, the methane problem. You recently have a piece called Weather Coverage in New Mexico is Missing the Mark. I'll have you talk about that. And you have a 12-month series. This topic needs 12 months. I'm sorry we only have half an hour, but it's called At the Precipice, New Mexico's Changing Climate, and that's with New Mexico in depth. So thank you both for your work and your efforts to enlighten us. So either one of you can go first. What do you most want, from all of your experience and research, what do New Mexicans need to know about the situation, the water situation in New Mexico right now? Um, we are in um, uh, really close to a state of crisis. Uh, for the last couple of decades, we've been walking this line uh, of uh, having sufficient water supply. And um, we always seem to get bailed out by the rain. The drought stops, and the rain comes, and the water keeps coming out of the tap. So it's a general unawareness or lack of awareness or for forgetfulness about uh, where we live in a very water poor state and um, how this is a public resource. Water is a public resource in New Mexico. It belongs to, to everybody and uh, people need to be uh, more aware and uh, understand uh, the, how precious uh, the resource is. And making people more aware as a freelance journalist, Laura, what, what are you trying to get people to notice about our water situation? Right. I just wanted to echo what Peggy said about how we really are on sort of the, the brink of a crisis. And I think that when people, when the public understands water issues, they do a great job. You know, people are asked to switch out their lawns, and they do, or to reduce their water use, and they do. And, and people in New Mexico really have done a great job with that, but there are sort of bigger institutions institutional issues that um, I try to help people understand in terms of um, who the big water users are, how we use water in New Mexico, how water rights work, um, and thinking long term about how as our region continues to warm that's going to have larger and larger impacts on our surface water and it'll also affect our groundwater either because the it's a place where the groundwater and the surface water are connected or because people will continue to rely more and more on pumping from aquifers instead of sort of living within the limits our climate is imposing upon us. You, it reminds me of the old saying in the West about water that whiskey's for drinking but water's for fighting. And do you f anticipate a form of 
I won't say water wars, but but really fighting for water. Well, look we're, look at our our situation with Texas right now. I have this probably naive and very optimistic view for New Mexico. We have we have faced so many challenges over our history for hundreds of years, and I really I like to envision a. a place where we come together and recognize it's not farmers against cities, it's not environmentalists trying to protect rivers against farmers or cities. Um, I think that it would really be nice for us all to come together and recognize the ways in which farmers rely on the environment and cities and residents rely on farmers and how we all need to really be looking out for one another so that there aren't big winners and losers in the future. And that's the value of science and your studies, to let people know, what is aquifer mapping? What do we learn from that? Uh, aquifer mapping is a program that um, we officially started at the Bureau in uh, about 2004 uh, with funding uh, from the state legisla uh, legislature. Uh, to the New Mexico Bureau of Geology. And it's really something that we've been doing at the Bureau for the last 30 years. Uh, it is the study of, it's bringing together multiple science disciplines, um, geology, which uh, is the foundation of our organization, and uh, hydrology, the study of water, and other uh, scientific disciplines like geochemistry and geophysics that tell us something about the aquifer. Uh, it's a shape how old the water is uh, and the extent of the aquifers. And we put all that information together and it tells the people and the state decision makers what our aquifers are like, what's the physical model of the aquifers. How old is our water? And how much does it vary in regions of the state? Now, this is fascinating. Paleo hydrology. Mm -hmm. And then answer that, we'll move on to other things. But as soon as you said that, my little ears right. pricked up. How old is our, most of our water? Um, the bulk of the water in storage in our aquifers, even our major aquifers that are connected to the river, like the Rio Grande, is um, over 10,000 years old. Um, the studies that have been done everywhere, uh, Albuquerque Basin, Santa Fe, Taos, about the upper few hundred feet of the aquifer where it's recharged with fresh water, the uh, water is um, a, a few hundred to a few thousand years old. Below that, it's 20,000, 30,000 years old. So this is water that was recharged in the Pleistocene age when the climate was much colder, much wetter, and we had glaciers and you know perennial snowpack everywhere. And it has not received a lot of recharge since. So our, our sustainable water supply that is at the top of the aquifer is, is, is quite limited. Well, I had read that California, when they have had their big drought that they're really not out of yet, that they were using ancient water, 65,000-year-old water, to water the almond groves. There's, you're never going to get that water back. Now, you mentioned the balance between the groundwater and, and the, the deep water, the living water, what do you call it, the, the, the streams and the rechargeable uh -huh. water. And the, so how... What should we be tapping into this water? I I mean, I tend to be really conservative, so I, I would say, like, no, not unless it's, you know, really sort of an emergency. But I, I feel like um, when when sort of large larger scale population moved into the southwest and moved into New Mexico, it wasn't feasible to be, you know, making a living farming or engaging in, in big industry, whether that's mining or having big cities, it, it wasn't necessarily feasible and to rely just on surface water. And so we had this great technology by which we could use fossil fuels to build pumps to pump groundwater. And, you know, that's really, I think, what helped agriculture grow up in eastern New Mexico and our cities we rely on that groundwater and um, 
you know, maybe it's just not within human nature to always want to live within our limits. But I think now with the work that Peggy and others are doing in New Mexico really shows that we need to think really carefully about our groundwater use because especially as we move forward and there's less surface water to rely upon in many years, you sort of the groundwater is kind of our savings account. And when we steal or use or abuse that water, are we stealing from the future or from the past? That's a good question. Good question. I haven't looked at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when these endeavors started, as, as Laura was discussing, uh, agriculture and industry uh, in the early part of the 1900s and even late 1800s, people had no idea about that there was water that was old or there was age. They had a need, they found a way to supply it, and they, took, they, they were off and running. And uh, largely, you know, our perspective has not changed. People have a need. They want to build businesses. They want the economy to grow. And they're still going back to the resource, even they, though they should know better, even though we have information. They are in a, um, a mode of operation where they just go and take it. And they are not thinking uh, of the future. They're not thinking of who they're taking the water from or uh, that it's uh, something that needs to be preserved uh, to some extent, C not preserved but conserved, used wisely. And we are not making those c uh, good choices. We are not making, uh, we're making very bad choices and poor choices about how much water we take, where we take it from, and what we use it for. Well, I'm sitting here in a way with the alpha and omega. You have the science and you have the facts, and you have the media and the communications and the, the ability to get it out. But there's a lot of people who really don't want to think about That's it, right. don't want to worry about it, thinking they're always going to be able to turn on the tap. So how, without mm -hmm. frightening them, do you educate them enough to know we're in trouble, you call <coughs> it a crisis, um, but there are things that we can do I know that Santa Fe really dramatically reduced its water per capita intake. And so um, how, what kind of response do you get from, I was reading some of the comments on some of your things, some of them were, of uh, their climate change deniers. Mm -hmm. And so put together the drought and the vanishing, you know, uh, surface water. And how do you, do you ever get discouraged as you come and bring this information again and people are still saying, no. I think it can be discouraging. It's sort of combined with this moment in history in the last decade or so where we've really seen journalistic resources constrained. You see um, newspapers pulling back on their coverage in many areas, uh, smaller newsrooms, even smaller newspapers sometimes. Um, you know, there was kind of maybe 10 years ago, there was this big push for um, newspapers to have a reporter who was focused specifically on the environment and here in New Mexico we had a handful of environment reporters and those people those positions are gone for the most part now and so I think it really it's really um, it's unfortunate because as these water issues become more and more important they're not just environment issues I think that I would love to see water coverage that you know seeps its way into business reporting, especially business reporting, reporting on the economy, yes. but also um, <coughs> planning and local politics. And I just the it's reporting on water and reporting on climate change shouldn't just be considered the environment reporters beat anymore. Well, we're speaking today with journalist Laura Pascas. Thank you for joining us, and Peggy Peggy Johnson. Thank you for joining us. So as a hydrologist or hydrogeologist, you find out, you say, we have this much water, it's this old, and it's, and it's here. And then how else can you as a scientist reach out? Because what Laura is saying, this should be in every section of the paper and on the news. This should be in business. This should be in education. This should be in science. So how have you as a scientist and your your the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. How have you been able to get out 
information about this, you know, to pass your knowledge on to the public? Uh, that's a great question uh, and one kind of near and dear to my heart because when I do studies uh, and I gather all of this information, one of the things that we always do is we set up a network of wells where we monitor the water levels and we might compare those data that we're collecting to uh, historic data so we can see how much the aquifers have declined. And uh, we leave those networks in place, we try to, uh, to uh, serve the community after uh, we finish studying. And we uh, put together what we've uh, learned and uh, take it to the communities. And there is um, always an, an overwhelming interest in, in what we're doing and what we've learned. And that's one way that we can sort of capture uh, the interest of um, the public and uh, educate them about their resources. And we've been able to do this uh, gratefully with, a, with the support for the aquifer mapping program uh, throughout the state. And it uh, makes a, a very big difference in those communities uh, to people who want to know more. Uh, many people out there really are seeking this information and it's really kind of, I think, the, the media um, blackout, so to speak, I don't know if that's a, the right the term, but um, not making it Oh, you know, publicly available on a broad scale. We certainly do our part. It's part of our mission at the Bureau of Geology to uh, make this information publicly accessible on our web page, in our reports, and uh, extend um, this information through uh, workshops and uh, lectures and uh, to the legislators themselves in terms of decision making and also the state regulatory agencies, the state engineer, NMED, they all get our information so everybody is using the same, you know, information and it's uh, and that's what gets me. It's not that there isn't a lot of news about this. There's extreme weather. There's a, the Animus River, there's a Gila Diversion, there's, uh, the, uh, there's just so many things that are in the news constantly. And we need, a, you, as you say, we need a broader context. We need to, this affects you. Yes, it was 105 in Roswell yeah. for a month. And how does this affect you? Well, they're thirsty, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, let's do a, just some of the hot topics, like the Animus River, who wants to take the, uh, the, the, that situation? Well, I think what happened last summer was an emergency and um, there were m many perhaps steps along the way where things could have been handled better. But for me, as somebody who has paid attention to these issues for a long time, I think that there are deeper, longer term issues that we need to be talking about in New Mexico and that I would love for our Secretary of the Environment to talk about in terms of not just pollution from that one event that occurred in Colorado that New Mexico is suing over, but what else we have, um, sort of long-term contamination. The Animus is not the only, in the San Juan are not the only rivers in New Mexico, not the only waterways in New Mexico that are exposed to waste from mining activities. And so I understand that that was an emergency that the state is trying to still deal with a year later, but I would have loved to have seen that open up a broader discussion about what else is happening in other places in New Mexico. The Gila, Diver Gila Diversion, you just wrote about it. I learned a term from, the, from my studies of that, which is paper water. <laughs> what is paper water, real quick, and what now we're not going to divert the entire, at a billion dollars, the Gila River. Uh, the projections did not make much sense, but now it's not going to happen. And so what is paper water, and, and is somebody going to come up again with this idea? Let's just move the river. So paper water refers to the water rights that the state actually has. The state of New Mexico has 14,000 acre feet of water rights to the Gila and its tributary. Um, but there's... No, there's sort of all sorts of tricks to how much of that water is actually available, especially as the climate continues warming and southern mountain ranges like the Mogollon Mountains down in the Gila will see less snowpack. So we're gonna see less water in the river. 
but there are also um, constraints where the state can only take a certain amount of water out of the river um, because they, we still need to make sure that that water gets to Arizona. And as much as um, I had reported a few weeks ago that the billion dollar diversion was off the table, there's some new developments and some new um, suggestions from the New Mexico CAP entity and it looks like the, um, the, the cost of the project that they're looking at now is around $700 million. So I think the main issue with the Gila diversion is the state has a limited amount of time to take some, to build something to get some water, but the plans are extremely um, not fleshed out at this moment in time and potentially are going to cost a lot more money than the state actually has access to. Your thoughts on that project? Um, that was a really good uh, discussion of uh, sort of the uh, social and political planning um, constraints. Um, I saw a uh, average hydrograph for the Gila River just recently that shows the mean uh, discharge over the course of a year. And it was uh, quite surprising. It was unique in a hydrograph, of a stream hydrograph, of anything that I've seen. Typically, you see it low in the winter. It comes up in snow melt or sometime in the spring, and it's low the rest of the year. The Gila was chaos. It uh, was a, it, it spikes uh, over the course of the year. It's erratic. The flows are extremely erratic and uh, not only over the course of the year, but from year to year. And what that told me as a hydrologist and a scientist is that there is no reliable water supply here. There's not a supply that you can depend on uh, from you know, one part, you know, seasonally to use seasonally. Uh, like our water use is, is generally a, a seasonal demand. And um, it seemed very, um, uh, again, poor choices about how to develop a resource and best use it. Well, we have really three minutes left, so we'll leave regional water planning and, and uh, desalinating brackish water. There's a lot of stuff because I really want you both, if you were to talk about conservation, is can we do anything with urban planning and with parallel piping and um, again, the role of the, the media, how do we get people to make it a statewide discussion? This We really can't avoid this anymore. It's really time. And one last thing, if people really, once, once the people that you reach and that are concerned, they would like to know what they can do. So let's talk about conservation and what you each want people to know. Um, I would like uh, people to remember that um, everything that we, uh, in, in order to develop the resource wisely and sustainably, you have to have a very good understanding of its limitations and, uh, and how you can um, develop like groundwater resources without impacting surface water and how to use them wisely. And that's based on science. It's based on an understanding, a physical understanding of uh, the subsurface and our watersheds. And uh, we need to uh, support those efforts uh, of our state agencies and our federal research agencies that do so much to enlighten us and the decision makers and the public and, um, and pay attention to um, the information that they provide. I would just love to see, I know that there are so many engaged readers out there who pay attention to the work that Peggy does and to the work that that I do and other reporters do in New Mexico. And I think, I think one, one thing that's kind of missing sometimes is a dialogue. Oftentimes reporters only hear from people who completely hate the story, don't believe in climate change. Those are the people who tend to comment on stories or call up editors and publishers. And I think when you read a story, um, you know, sending a note to the reporter or the editor to ask questions that you might have 
um, about what's happening in your region or something that you see in a news story that piques your interest, I think um, the more dialogue there is and the more dialogue you have with your elected officials and saying, hey, I'm really interested about water. I know there was you know, this big legislative push a few years ago for year of the water. Um, you know, what are legislators doing now, not just to bring home water to their immediate constituents, but to be planning for the future and to be planning for the long-term future of the state? And I have a, I'd like to close on a personal note. You've watched water in its, you know, glory days and in its diminished status, and I know that you love some rivers, and, and you love to be on the river, but Sometimes when you realize that the world is changing and that rivers are dying, ghost rivers you call them, and that species, some species are going extinct, does that re-energize your efforts to try to get the word out? How do you feel about those, mm -hmm. that aspect of it? I know you're an objective journalist and an objective scientist, mm -hmm. but tell me how, how the, what feelings this brings up for you when you go where there was a river and it's not anymore. Yeah. Um, to, to me, I think of my most uh, recent uh, project at the La Cienega Wetlands, um, springs and wetlands and places on the earth where uh, groundwater comes out and is that interface between the two systems are so special. Um, they provide uh, habitat and a very, are very ecologically important. And, but they also, they support acequias, they support uh, culture. And there are places that, um, to me, are so special that it pains me to see uh, people disregarding that and uh, not um, honoring how, how precious that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that what I can do can at least uh, educate people and uh, make them more broadly aware of uh, those special places. And I spend a lot of time writing about depressing issues or issues that can make people really mad sometimes. And I think it's, it's easy to get sad and it kind of sometimes can feel good to get all riled up and angry. But for me, like the, the reason I have continued to do this work is this overwhelming sense of love for New Mexico. And I think even, um, you know, I report a lot on the Rio Grande and 17 miles have, of the river have gone dry in the past couple of weeks. And the thing that kind of sustains me through that is when you go out to the river, there's still things that are really beautiful. There's still this sort of beauty and sense of peace and going down to the Gila with its crazy hydrograph. I mean, it's just amazing to see um, what that river can do when it's at a high flood stage, the cottonwoods knocked over and just this sort of this, this beauty yeah. that we have in this state and that future generations have a right to enjoy that as well. Well, our cup has overflowed today. I want to thank our guest, Laura Paskus, thank freelance you. journalist, and Peggy Johnson. Thank you both for bringing your, your vision and your intelligence and your insights into our most, I think, our most pressing issue. And uh, maybe we'll, let's revisit this. There's a lot, a lot more to find out. Hey, I'm Lorene Mills. I want to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.